John chapter 6, John chapter 6. If you've not been here in a little while, let me just refresh you right now as a church. We are in the midst of a 21-week series going chapter by chapter through the book of John, looking at his selected pictures. John writes in each chapter with the express purpose of letting us know that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is the eternal son of God. And uh, we find ourselves now in week six and in John chapter six. And before we start reading, let me kind of set the scene and give you some context, because as you know, text without context is a con. So here, here's the, the setup for John chapter six. As a matter of fact, it's the longest chapter uh, that we find here in the book of John. It uh, comes in at a whopping 71 verses, and uh, John breaks it into four distinct sections. The first two sections of this chapter record for us two very familiar stories, two very familiar miracles. Uh, the first, section one, is the feeding of the 5,000. Many of us would know that story. As a matter of fact, what's really neat about this story, this miracle, is that it's recorded in all four gospel accounts, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and of course here in John. And then we get into section two in the second story, the second miracle, where Jesus walks on the water. And I love this one. There's some important things for us to learn within this story. And this story is recorded in three of the four gospel accounts. And when you consider each of these stories against the backdrop of the entire chapter, what we realize is that these stories are actually setting the scene for section three. They build upon each other and get us to the heart and soul of the chapter where Jesus begins to teach the crowd. And what he does in his teaching is use imagery from these first two stories, from these first two sections. And then he also uses a lot of language from the Old Testament book of Exodus. And in this teaching, Jesus reveals to the crowd and he reveals to us who he really is and what it means to really follow him. Which leads us into the final section of the chapter. It confronts us with a choice. Am I going to accept Jesus' teaching or am I going to reject it? And just like the hearers of the day this morning, we too will have to choose whether to accept it or reject it. So like I said, it's a big chapter, 71 verses, and here's sort of our plan of attack. Uh, we're going to start by diving into the first two sections, these first two stories, and then quickly from there jump into Jesus' teaching because that is the heart and soul of the chapter. We're going to look at what he says. We're going to talk about its meaning and its implications for us as believers, and then if all goes according to plan, we're going to end just like this chapter ends with a question and with a choice. Am I going to accept or am I going to reject what Jesus has just said? So needless to say, a lot to cover this morning, more to say than I have time to say it in. So why don't we start by praying and asking the Holy Spirit to be our guide? How about that? Come on, let's pray. Father, we, we come to you now in the name of your son, Jesus. And first and foremost, we say thank you for your word. Thank you that it's living and breathing and active, that is sharper than any two-edged sword. We know your word is supernatural. So we ask now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate your word to us. May it act like a mirror, Father, to reflect and show back to us the things that need to shift and change in our life. But may it also, Holy Spirit, act like a light so that we could see the Father's plan for us to move forward into the call that he's placed upon us because ultimately we want our lives to glorify and magnify the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you help us today? It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, amen, amen. If you got your Bible, John chapter six, verse number one. John writes, he says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Just keep your Bible open. We're, we're going to go through quite a few verses here, but I want to just pause and highlight a couple of things as we go. First and foremost, John begins by saying, after these things. Well, what things, John? After Jesus worked many different miracles in many different cities amongst many different regions. After these things, then he writes in verse 2 that a great multitude followed him. Now, that word multitude in the original language in the Greek speaks of a, uh, of a large mob of people, a large crowd of people. That's pretty obvious. And that word, honestly, by itself would probably be enough to describe the, the scene. But John adds another word. He adds a descriptor. He calls it a great 
multitude. He's letting us know that this is the biggest and the largest crowd of people that has followed Jesus up to this point in his ministry. He's talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And he says this great multitude followed Jesus. If you've got a pen, maybe circle that word followed. That, that word in the original language is in the infinitive form. In other words, it means they, they followed and they followed and they followed and they followed. Whichever direction Jesus went, the crowd, they, they went. Whatever direction Jesus turned, the crowd, they, they turned. Whatever region Jesus went into, they went into as well. Why? Verse 2 tells us because they saw. That word in the original language literally speaks of spectators that are sitting at a play and or a performance. It's a theatrical term. They're, they're watching. They're, they're seeing a scene unfold in front of them. Well, what exactly are they seeing? Verse 2 tells us again, they see Jesus perform miracles on the diseased. And that word perform is an interesting word in the original language. It's the Greek word poeo, which literally is where we get our English word poet meaning that there was a creative flair and or creative action taking place. So in context, what this is saying is that Jesus is not just performing simple miracles on the crowd, but there's a creative aspect, element, and flair to Jesus' miracles. He's creating eyes where there were no eyes. He's creating limbs where there were no limbs. Jesus is doing the impossible. There's this creative aspect to the miracles. And as the people sat, they watched enthralled by what they saw. And that's why they followed and followed and followed wherever Jesus went. Verse number three says, and Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. Again, just, just pause. A couple of things to note. Really important here. It says Jesus went up on a mountain there. He sat with his disciples. John is being really intentional in his language. He says Jesus went up on a mountain. This is a direct reference to the Old Testament and to the character and story of Moses at Mount Sinai. And just keep Moses in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to him time and time again. But John is reminding his readers, he's reminding us that God things happen up on mountains, that mountains are important places, that supernatural things happen up on mountains. And he records that Jesus goes up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now, any time in the ancient world, a rabbi would sit it's time to focus in and pay attention because he's about to reveal something definitive about God, the law, or the Torah. To sit is to take the posture of a teacher. And then he highlights for us that the Passover was near. By saying that, John's doing a couple of things. First, he's obviously giving us context. He's letting us know the, the time of year, that it's near the Feast of Passover. And what this does is it gives credibility to the great multitude of people who are following Jesus because they're making their pilgrimage from whatever city, perhaps Capernaum. Now they're on their way to Jerusalem. That's what Passover was. It was a pilgrimage feast where everyone came from their cities and from their towns and made their way to Jerusalem. So John is setting context, but he's also intentionally drawing our attention back to the Old Testament character of Moses with whom the Passover started. Again, just file Moses away in the back of your mind. He's going to play a prominent role as we continue within the chapter. Look at verse number five. It says, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, who was one of his disciples, he said, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for this crowd that every one of them may even have a little. So, so catch the picture here. Jesus lifts up his eyes. They're up on the mountain. He sees this large multitude of people coming and he turns to Philip and he goes, hey, where are we going to get enough bread to feed these people? But John says Jesus knows already what he's going to do, but he said this to test Philip. Now, that word test in the original language is a test designed to reveal a deficiency. Now, if you insert yourself here into the text, it would seem to me that after the disciples had seen all of the creative and miraculous things that Jesus had been doing, 
that either Philip or one of the disciples would have said, like, Lord, um, I don't know how we're going to feed these people or where we're going to get the bread. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do, but you're here. And um, we've seen you do the impossible, and we've come to know and believe that with you, nothing is impossible. But they don't respond like that, do they? Instead of responding in faith, they Im immediately move into panic and fear. Right, Philip, he goes into math mode, verse seven. He's like, man, 200 denarii or, or 200 days worth of salary wouldn't be enough to even give each of these people a little bit to eat. Let me give us something to consider this morning. How many times in our own lives have we seen God do the miraculous? How many times in our lives have we seen God do the miraculous for other people, but then yet in moments of need, instead of responding in faith, we respond like these disciples and we move into panic and fear. Right? I'd love to stand up here and tell you that as a pastor, as a man of God, I never move into fear, but truth be told, and it's embarrassing to admit this, I oftentimes find myself in this same place, especially when it comes to the area of finances. And the truth is, I can't even tell you why I begin to move into fear. It's not like I can point back to a specific moment that triggers this memory and now I move into fear, but for whatever reason, every time the topic of finances come up, I feel this fear and or consternation begin to bubble up within my, my soul. And again, it's not like I can point to a traumatic moment. It just happens. But honestly, if I reflect back, the opposite of that is true. Like I've never had a traumatic, God's always been faithful. God, God's always taken care of me, my family. God's always taken care of the church. But yet it's so weird because often when finances come up, I find myself going into panic mode. But when I actually take the time to remember and think back, I know that Psalm 37 and 25 is true. Many of you know this verse. I've experienced it in my life. You've experienced it in your life. The verse goes like this. I was young, but now I'm old. Almost 40. <laughs> Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor have I seen his descendants begging bread. In other words, God is always taking care of our needs. As a family, as a church, he's always taking care of, of my needs. But again, if I'm honest, when it comes to this area of finances, for whatever reason, I find myself moving into fear rather than faith. And when I do that, I know it's because I'm not doing a good job of remembering. And thank God for my wife. Man, I, I married way above my, my, my pay grade. Our Australian friends would say it like this, that I'm punching above my weight class. And she is so good about this. And she sees me starting to stress out with finances. She goes, hey, hey, remember how good God's been. Remember how he came through last time. Remember how he did the supernatural. And I wish I had time to go story by story by story of all the things God has done and provided for us. And what I do is then I begin to rehearse these moments over and over in my mind. I begin to rehearse them over and over from my, my lips. And I begin to thank God for his faithfulness. And as I remember the goodness of God, as I remember his creative power in my life, I begin to find and feel his peace wash over me. And that fear begins to subside. Now, again, being vulnerable with you, for me, it's the area of finances. It may not be that for you. That area that takes you into to fear or panic might have to do with your health. It might have to do with, with your kids. I'll, I'll let you fill in the blank. But when you find yourself moving from uh, faith into fear, I just want to encourage you to remember what God has done for you, to remember what God has done for others, to remember his faithfulness. And here's the key to remembering. I mentioned it a moment ago. The key is rehearsing. Rehearse it verbally with your mouth. Talk about the stories. Thank God for his faithfulness, but then as well, rehearse it in your mind. Meditate upon those moments. Think about them often. I'm telling you, if he was faithful before, he's going to be faithful again. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's go back to the text for a moment. Verse number eight. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, um, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are these among so many? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. So here the disciples, 
instead of asking Jesus what he wants to do in the situation, they go on a food hunt. They're like, we got to make this, we got to make this happen. So they go looking for food and verse nine says they find a lad. And I really love this. That word lad in the original language speaks of somebody that's under seven years old. This is a little boy. And by the way, little kids play a prominent role in God's kingdom. They find a lad, a young man who's got five mini muffins or five barley crackers and two little pickled sardines that he uses as relish on the crackers. I like to call it a little Hebrew happy meal. This kid's got a Hebrew happy meal. And one of the disciples sees the crackers and the fish and goes, hey, we got we to give this to Jesus. But he begins to do the math and the math is just not adding up. And he's like, Lord, look, we've got this. But what good are these things when there's so many? How many are we talking about? Verse 10 tells us about 5,000 men. Now, in the ancient days, they would have numbered just the men, but when you consider women and children, conservatively, we're talking about 12,000 people. When you consider that it is near the, uh, the, the feast of Passover and people are making their pilgrimage and they're traveling with their, their, their spouse and their kids and their grandparents and their goldfish and their dog, we, we could be talking upwards of 20,000 people. I saw one scholar put it at 40,000, but here is the point. With a multitude so great, and with what is currently available to feed them, the disciples see lack. But what does Jesus see? He sees grass. The disciples see lack, but Jesus sees grass. The end of verse 10, John highlights that there was much grass in the place, so Jesus made them sit down. Much grass. It's a really interesting detail, isn't it? It got me thinking, why would John put that detail there in the story? So I started to dig a little bit. And when you read this same story out of Mark's gospel account, Mark chapter 6, verse 34 through 39, you, you read this, there's more detail given. It says this, that Jesus sees the multitude and he has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then Mark highlights the fact that there was much green grass in the place. So Jesus made them sit down on the green grass. Interesting. Does that language remind you of anything you've ever heard before? Maybe Psalm 23. The Lord, he's my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down or sit down in green pastures amongst the green grass. So both John and Mark, they record these details for us to draw our attention back and remind us that Jesus, he's not just a man. He's the God man. He's the good shepherd. And not only does he care for the flock, but he provides for the flock. And as we jump into the next section of verses, we're going to see the miraculous provision of the good shepherd. Look at verse number 11. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they, the crowd wanted. So when they were filled, when the crowd was filled, Jesus said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. A couple of things to note here. It says Jesus, he, he took the loaves. Can I just tell you, Jesus will take whatever it is we're willing to give him. Could be much or it could be meager, but whatever we are willing to offer him, he is willing to take and he can do much more with what we give him than we could do with it ourselves. Jesus, he takes the loaves or he takes the crackers and the Bible says he, he gave thanks. Literally, there was an overflow of gratitude, an overflow of, of worship and thanksgiving to God. But you're like, it's just a couple crackers. Like, Jesus, what are you giving thanks for? He's thanking the Father for his provision. And as Jesus gave gratitude and worship and thanksgiving to God, a miracle began to take place. What was in his hands began to multiply. And hear me, this is what happens when we put what we have into the hands of Jesus. And when Jesus asks you for something, we have to remember, he's not asking us so that he can take it. He's asking us so that he can multiply it. And he wants to multiply it to the point where not only you abound or I abound, but so that we are able to then bless others as well. Right? Verse 12 says that all the people, that whole multitude, they were filled. 
That word filled in the original language is there twice. They were filled, filled. They were filled to overflowing. They ate and they ate and they ate until their bellies began to ache. Reminding us that God is not a God of lack. He's the God of abundance. He's the God of more than enough to the point where John records that Jesus tells his disciples to pick up the fragments and there are 12 basketfuls left over, one for each of the disciples. And here's what I want us to consider this morning, that Jesus is trustworthy with the things that we commit to him. He's trustworthy with the things that we put into his hand, that we don't have to be afraid to put things in his hand, whether it's our talents, whether it's our finances, whether it's our family, whether it's our lives, our jobs, our dreams for the future. I'm reminded what Paul would write to Timothy and say, hey, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to guard, keep, and hold the things that I commit to him. I'm reminded of what the great reformer Martin Luther has said. He said, I've held many things in my hand, and I've lost them all. But whatever I've placed in God's hands, those things I still possess. And then we get to verse number 14. And this acts as a bit of a segue that takes us not only to the next story and to the next miracle, but actually foreshadows the heart and soul of what Jesus is going to teach us in just a few minutes. If you got your Bible, verse 14, it says, Then those men, or the crowd, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. When they had seen the sign that Jesus did, what, what was the sign? That there in the wilderness, Jesus had miraculously fed the multitude with bread. Why is this significant? It's significant because it reminds the people of how God worked through Moses to feed Israel in the wilderness with manna, with bread from heaven. Here's Moses again. And listen, it cannot be overstated how important a figure Moses is to the Jewish people. He was their first and he was their greatest rescuer and redeemer. He was the one that took them out of slavery in Egypt and led them through the wilderness into their promised land of freedom. And for the multitude, this act of Jesus multiplying the bread is connecting them in their minds back to their national hero, back to Moses. And then notice the next phrase that the crowd uses when they describe Jesus. They use this phrase. Truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. And what we miss in our 21st century eyes would have been plainly obvious for John's first century readers. Again, John is intentionally drawing our attention back to Moses. In Deuteronomy 18 and 15, Moses had prophesied this, that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. So in the minds of the people, if the coming prophet was going to be like Moses, it made all kind of sense that he would also feed the people miraculously with bread, just like Moses had fed the children of Israel. And again, this comparison to Moses, just, just file that way. I, I promise we're going to come back and make a greater point in just a moment. But at this point in the story, after being fed to the point of overflow and now connecting the miracle back to Moses' prophecy about the coming prophet, it's easy to say that the crowd, the multitude, they are in a frenzy. So much so, verse 15 records for us that they try and take Jesus by force to make him their king. But this is not the type of king that Jesus came to be. He had come to establish a spiritual kingdom, but the crowd, they wanted him to be a physical king. They wanted to make him king because he could fill their bellies and give them stuff. And as long as Jesus would give them what they wanted, they would love him. As you read this, it's very transactional. It's very, what have you done for me lately? That's unfolding here in the text. And we read that, and if we're not careful, it gets really easy to criticize the crowd for their behavior and their thinking. But truth be told, as the scripture acts like a mirror, this is the point in the story where we have to ask ourselves, how often do we act just like the crowd? Where our following and our love for Jesus is predicated upon what he can do for me and what he can give me. And make no mistake, don't, don't get me wrong, he is a giving 
God. He delights in blessing his people, right? Ephesians 3.20, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we could ask, think, or imagine. But hear me, we have to first love him and obey him for who he is, not what he does for us. We worship him, we follow him, we obey him because he's creator, he's Lord, and he's God. And that comes first. So Jesus, knowing that the crowd is going to try and forcibly make him king, he sends them away and he retreats to the solitude of the mountain. I'm so impressed by this, by the humility of our savior, because he's not impressed or seduced by the crowd. He's not looking to find his identity in what the crowd says about him. No, he sends them away. And instead of indulging the crowd, he goes off by himself to pray and to be with the Father. What an example that is, especially now in our modern day social media driven lives where we live and die by the voice and the opinion of the crowd. And Jesus goes away up on the mountain, gets away from the many voices of the crowd and leans into one voice, the voice of the Father. He was more interested in what the Father had to say than he was hearing the applause and the adulation of the crowd. Let me ask you, and I'll just kind of let this one linger in the air for a moment. Whose voice is shaping your life? Is it the voice of the crowd? Do you live and die by your next social media post and what people have to say about it? Whose voice is shaping your life, the crowd or the Father? So Jesus, he makes his way up on the mountain, and then the text transitions into section two and miracle two of our story. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go verse by verse here. I'm just going to summarize. You can go back through it this week and read each verse in detail. But verses 16 through 21, we, we see some things begin to unfold. The first couple of verses tell us how now evening has come and the disciples, they go down to the sea and they get into a boat and they're going to cross the sea and they're going to go to the city of Capernaum. It's on the, the far side of the Sea of Galilee. And one interesting note about that is that in both Matthew's account and Mark's account of this same story, it records that Jesus actually made his disciples go down and get into the boat. He made them get into the boat. Why? Perhaps Jesus saw the effect that the crowd was having on the disciples. Maybe they were getting caught up and carried away with the crowd's excitement and desire to make Jesus king. And they're beginning to think, where do I fit in this positionally in this new kingdom? And they're becoming seduced by the voice of the crowd. I don't know. That might be my thought, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that Jesus makes them get into the boat and he sends them off by themselves to cross the sea. Meanwhile, Jesus goes back up on the mountain to pray. Such an interesting picture. Verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, as the disciples are in the boat, a storm comes up on the sea and John uses specific language. He says, a great wind begins to blow. This is a sizable storm. Now we might be scared if a sizable storm came up, but you got to remember most of these disciples are professional fishermen. They spent their lives on the water. So when it says a storm arose, we don't need to immediately infer that they're afraid for their lives. I think as you keep reading, you actually find the opposite to be true. They're not afraid. They're more frustrated. Verse 19 says that they had rowed three or four miles. And then when you look at Matthew and Mark's account of the story, you see that from their starting location, it was seven miles across the Sea of Galilee, and it should have only taken them two hours by boat. But now it's the middle of the night. They've been rowing for six plus hours, and they still have half the distance to cover. Let me ask you, you ever been there before? Not, not on the Sea of Galilee, but... Have you ever been in that place of obedience where you're doing exactly what Jesus asked you to do, yet it seems like a great storm has arisen? It seems like the wind is in your face. It seems like no matter what you do, everything is going wrong. Everything is harder than it has to be. And it seems like you can't quite get that forward momentum. You ever been there before? I have, even presently, if I'm honest. This is something I've, I've talked about many times here from this pulpit, but two years ago, we felt God tell our church that we were supposed to launch a campus in, in Nashville. So out of obedience to what God was asking us to do, we went 
And God opened all kinds of doors. I could sit here and tell you story after story. God has given us unprecedented favor in the city. He has surrounded our team with the highest quality of people. We have this core group that, that make up the beginnings of a, of a congregation. Everything was going great until it wasn't. Because we've been ready to launch our church for a year, but we've not been able to find a venue. We've been ready to launch this Cottonwood campus, but there's not been a, a venue come, come available. As a matter of fact, we've checked out venue after venue, and we've gone, and it's looked promising, and they've led us on, they've strung us on for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, only to then go, ah, you know what, it's not gonna work. And you're like, Lord, you told us to go. You surrounded us with favor. We've been wanting to launch this in obedience, but it just seems like every door keeps getting shut. And after hearing no, after no, after no, you're not able to go anymore. Hey, you know, like God's got something better for us. It actually becomes a point and a subject of frustration. Because although we've been obedient to what God has asked us to do, we feel like the disciples, you've been straining at the oar, tirelessly going, but you're having to fight the wind every step of the way. Again, that's sort of our story presently. But I'll let you fill in the blank. What's your story? If you're in that place, there's a couple of things that we need to consider from the next few verses. First of all, it's this, that following Jesus doesn't mean the absence of storms in our life. Right? Like, contrary to popular opinion, following Jesus does not mean you have a perfect, easy life. If you got told that, and if that's what you signed up for, <laughs> you got lied to. <laughs> On the contrary, these disciples, they're in the middle of Jesus's will. They are obeying his command. They're doing exactly what they've been asked to do, yet they find themselves in a storm. That gives me great hope. Not because I'm a masochist and I, I, I love storms, no, but, but because storms are often an implication and an indicator that I'm on the right track. Here's the second thing to consider, and this one gives me such great hope, that even in the midst of a storm, Jesus has his eye on us. He's got his eyes on us. Mark's account of this same story records that Jesus is up on the mountain, that he's praying. He's communing with the Father. And as he's up with the Father, the Bible says this in, in the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 48, that Jesus saw the disciples straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Please catch this imagery. Jesus is up with the Father, yet his eyes are on the disciples as they strain, as they fight. Here's why I want you to see this imagery, because it's exactly what Jesus is doing right now. He's up in heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and you know what he's doing? He's praying. He's praying. And as you and I struggle at the oars of this life, he's also got his eyes on us. His eyes are on us, and he's praying for us. Listen to this verse out of Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, verse 25, therefore Jesus is able to also save forever, completely, perfectly for eternity, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede and intervene on their behalf with God. So not only does Jesus have his eyes on you, he's praying for you. He's talking to the Father about you. He lives to intercede on your behalf. And hear me, if Jesus is praying for me, Listen, there's no storm in the world that can take me under. And then quickly, going back to the text, verse 19, this is where things get really interesting. Here we see Jesus come down off the mountain and begins to walk on top of the water towards the boat. This is super significant for a few reasons. One, just like the disciples, when we find ourselves in a storm, you can take comfort in the fact that we're not alone. Right? Not only does Jesus see us, not only is Jesus praying for us, but he comes toward us. He comes to us, and he does that through his Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is our comforter, our helper, and our ever-present guide. Secondly, Jesus walking on the water is super important. It's significant because it shows us that he has all power over demonic forces. This one is, this one is significant. In the ancient world, the sea was thought to be the domain of darkness. It was thought to be the place where demonic entities dwelled. You remember that story? Jesus crosses the sea, and he comes to this place, and there's a demoniac that comes out, and Jesus casts out the demons, and the demons start speaking to Jesus and say, we are legion, for we are many. 
And Jesus says, you got to come out of here. And they go, well, look, look, don't send us to the abyss. Let us go into that herd of swine. So Jesus is like, go. They go into the herd of swine. The swine run off a cliff and drown themselves in the sea. We, we read that and we're like, man, that's, that's weird. But in the first century, it would have been understood that those demons were going back to their stronghold, back to their place of dwelling there in the sea. And here in our text, we see Jesus coming to the disciples and he's walking on top of the water. He's walking on top of the domain of darkness, demonstrating his total power over supernatural and demonic forces. And there is nothing in this world, not a principality, not a power, not a ruler, not a thing of darkness that can stop our Jesus. He's got all power. And then, then lastly, this picture of Jesus walking on the water, it's significant because once again, it connects us back to the story and to the character of Moses. And it does that in, in, a, in a couple of ways. First, it connects us back to Moses in, in a very obvious way. You remember it was, it was Moses who demonstrated power over the elements, right? He split the Red Sea and he led the children of Israel across on, on dry land. But here in our story, Jesus, the greater Moses, he doesn't have to split the sea, but rather he demonstrates his power over the elements by walking on top of the sea. The second way that John connects us back to Moses is by recording the specific language that Jesus uses when he walks near the boat. You can read it here in the Gospel of John. He says, guys, it's I. It is I. Don't be afraid. That language, it's I. Remember back in the Old Testament, Moses had that burning bush encounter with God. And God says, hey, look, the, the cries of my people have come forth. I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to go to Pharaoh. And I want you to say to him, let my people go. And Moses goes, oh, okay, cool, Lord. But who should I tell Pharaoh sent me? What does God say? He says, tell him I am sent you. So when Jesus approaches the disciples in the storm and says, don't be afraid, it is I. As a matter of fact, in the language, it's the same exact phrase that God used when he spoke to Moses, that I am language. And what he's doing, he's revealing to his disciples afresh that he is divine, that he is God, that he is the supernatural Jehovah. This is revelation language. And on that note, when you consider the same story, Jesus walking on the water, but you read it from Mark's gospel, which by the way, Mark's gospel is Peter's eyewitness account. You see a similar revela revelation. You see similar revelation, but, but different language. Mark 6 and 48 says this. As Jesus comes walking on the water toward the boat, he was actually about to pass them by. Why would he do that? That's weird. He was about to pass them by. But Mark is using specific revelation language here. Where else have you seen that phrase, pass by? Moses. Remember, Moses says to God, God, reveal to me, show me your glory. And God says, Moses, no one can see my glory and live, but here's what I'll do. I'm going to place you in the cleft of a rock and I'm going to cause my backside to pass by you. So when Mark records that Jesus was about to pass by his disciples, he does it intentionally to take us back to the story of Moses. Now, one final word of encouragement before we jump into Jesus' teaching, this third section of the chapter. Verse 21 tells us that Jesus, he gets into the boat with the disciples, and I love this. As soon as he gets in the boat, it's recorded that the boat was immediately, immediately at the shore where they were going. Listen, you, you might be in a storm right now. You might feel like you are straining and struggling, not making any headway. Can I just encourage you? Stay obedient. Stay faithful. Lean into it. Remember that Jesus, he sees you. He's praying for you. He sent his Holy Spirit to help you and be present with you. And in a moment, in a moment, immediately, he's able to get you where you need to be. He's able to make up the time that you feel like you've lost and do a miracle that settles your soul. That's what I'm believing for in Nashville. It's felt like we've been training, but I'm believing that in a moment, immediately, we're going to have that miracle. The venue's going to open, and God is going to do the miraculous. It's going to seem like the time that was lost is actually made up. But you read this, and it's this cool miracle. Immediately, they're at the shore, but I don't know if you've ever been like me, and you read it, and you wonder, like, why didn't Jesus just calm the storm? 
Like, like there was precedent for that. He, he's done it before. Remember, he calmed the storm with the word. He said, peace, be still. Why doesn't he just do that now? Maybe you find yourself crying out in your storm for help. Going, Lord, Lord, calm the storm. You did it before. Lord, you calmed the storm for so and so. I've seen you do it. Would you do it now for me in the same way? But it hasn't happened for you, and you feel like, man, I'm just sitting here straining. God, why aren't you doing this again? Could it be that because God rarely does the same thing in the same way twice, he's actually wanting to do something new and different in your story? I don't know about you, but I do know this for sure. Our God is not a God who will be pigeonholed. And perhaps in the midst of storms, he's more interested in making sure we get a revelation of who he is rather than acting like a genie in the bottle and doing what we say when we say to do it. Perhaps just like in our story, God is wanting to reveal different aspects and characteristics of his nature that we wouldn't see outside the confines of a storm. Maybe he wants to reveal to us that he's not just savior, not just the one who can take us out of the storm, but actually he's sustainer, that he sees us through the storm, that he's not just rescuer, but he's also the provider. So again, maybe you feel like the disciples and you feel like you're in a season of frustration and straining. Listen, you can take heart. You can be a good cheer because King Jesus, he sees you. He's praying for you. He's with you by his Holy Spirit. He's got all power over demonic forces. And in the process of obedience, he's revealing to you new and glorious aspects of his nature and character. He's savior. He is sustainer. He is the rescuer and he is the provider. And then we come to the heart and soul of the chapter, section three, verses 22 through 59. And everything that John has recorded up until this point is setting us up for this moment. And we see this same crowd that had miraculously been fed by Jesus the day before. They're now looking for Jesus again, but they come to him with the wrong intentions. They had been fed well the day before, and now they show up in Capernaum looking for more of the same. They expect Jesus to be a free meal ticket for them. And in verse 26, if you got your Bible, Jesus is about to expose the motives of their heart. Verse 26, he says to the crowd, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In other words, you've now come to me because I filled your bellies and you want another free meal. You, you came to find me not because I have stuff to give you spiritually, but you came after me because you want the benefits that come from me for what I can physically do and physically provide for you. And what Jesus is doing is he's teaching them and he's teaching us that there's a greater hunger that needs to be fulfilled. And he's not talking about physical hunger in our bellies. He's talking about spiritual hunger in our hearts. This is a hunger that every human heart longs for, longs to be satisfied. And Jesus is saying, look, this hunger that you feel, it can only be filled and satisfied in a relationship with me. He's going, hey, look, guys, you're, you're in the right place, but you're after the wrong thing. It's not about your bellies being filled. It's actually about your soul and what's hungry and missing in your soul. I am the only one that can satisfy that need. Look at what he says in verse 27, and I, I, I promise I'm almost done. I, I promise we're, we're about to finish, but we need to catch this. Verse 27, Jesus reiterates this point. He says, hey, don't labor for the food which perishes but rather for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Here's what we have to see. Jesus is making a contrast between material things and spiritual things, but the crowd doesn't see it. The crowd doesn't get it. I wonder this morning, do you see it? Do you get it? Look at the crowd's response in verse 30. They go, what sign will you perform then? What, what new miraculous act will you do that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Jesus, we need you to perform. And then they bring up Moses in the Exodus story, and suddenly we understand why John has been constantly hinting at this throughout section one and section two. He's letting us know that Moses was a type and a shadow of Jesus who was to come. The life of Moses, the story of Moses, was just a precursor pointing us to Jesus. Watch this, verse 31. 
The people say, our fathers ate manna in the desert. There's the connection back to Moses. They ate manna in the desert. As is written, he, Moses, gave them bread from heaven to eat. And I love Jesus' response. In essence, he's going, oh, I see what you're doing here. Y'all like Moses? Okay, cool. Um, that's why you flock to me, because you think I'm, I'm like him, because he gave you and your father's bread in the wilderness, and I gave you bread in the wilderness yesterday. Oh, that's why you come. And Jesus is about to put all their misconceptions to bed. He goes, no, 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 I'm not like Moses. If anything, Moses is like me. Moses was just a foreshadow that pointed to me. And if you like the bread and the man that he gave your fathers, just wait, because thir verse 35, Jesus goes, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Drop down to verse 47. Jesus goes on. He doubles down on this thought. He says this, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Why? Verse 48, because I am the bread of life. And Jesus goes, this is what separates me from Moses. Verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. And guess what? They're dead. Jesus goes, look, I've come to give you something completely different, not physical bread. I come to give you eternal bread that gives you life. Verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. Verse 51, I am that living bread. I am that living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So three times in just a few short verses, Jesus makes this declaration. I am the bread of life. This is the first of seven. I am statements Jesus is going to make throughout this gospel of John. But in making this declaration, this is what Jesus is getting at. This is what he was saying to the multitude. This is what he's saying to us this morning. Number one, he's saying, hey, look, guys, I'm God. I'm God. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that I am is what theologians call Exodus language. Jesus is revealing himself to the crowd as God, that he is Jehovah, the same eternal covenant-keeping God that spoke with Moses, that revealed himself to Moses. We covered that just a moment ago at the burning bush. Moses goes, God, who, who shall I tell him sent me? God says, tell them I am sent you. Jesus is using this same language. He's declaring, I am that same eternal covenant keeping God. I am Jehovah. And guess what? Just like the crowd that day that heard those words, you and me today, we have to choose as well. Am I going to accept this or am I going to reject this? And the scripture tells us that many in the crowd that day, they struggled with this statement. Verse 60 says, this is a hard statement. As a matter of fact, it says that they began to argue amongst themselves. How can he make this declaration that he came down from heaven, but we know his parents? And they struggled with this, and they argued with it. And hear me, it's the same reflection of many in the crowd today. We hear this declaration of Jesus. I'm God, and I've come to bring you eternal life. But we argue about it. And because we can't figure everything out logically, because it's a hard statement to accept. Many of us walk away. This morning, the most important decision in your life will come down to how you respond to this claim of Jesus. Is he God or is he not? And I'm telling you, you have to choose. There's no middle ground here. This is a binary decision. Either he is the eternal son of God coming in the world to save you, or he was just a man a good moral teacher that lived 2,000 years ago. You have to choose. Is Jesus God or is he not? Here's the second thing that Jesus is revealing by saying, I am the bread of life. He's saying, look, guys, I'm the only one who satisfies. He's saying, I am the true fulfillment of what every human heart longs for. Meaning that if you look to anything else, anything outside of Christ to fulfill that hunger and thirst in your soul, you will find that it will not satisfy. That desire to be known and to have your identity secured, it will not be fulfilled 
in more human relationships. It will not be fulfilled in more sexual encounters. It will not be fulfilled by climbing the corporate ladder. It will not be fulfilled by having 10 degrees and the title doctor affixed to your name. Jesus says, I am the only true fulfillment. You want to be known? You want your identity to be secured? It's found. It's fortified in me. But how often do we look to these other things? And sure, maybe for a moment, having more relationships, it feels like physical bread and abates the hunger for a moment, only then to find out, ha, ah, it didn't do the job. I'm hungry again. I'm still unsatisfied. And everything we run to outside of Christ either turns out to be a cloud without rain or a well that is empty. Only Christ can fulfill that hunger you feel in your soul. As a matter of fact, Jesus goes one step further. He says this, verse 55, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And on the surface, this is a really hard and a really odd statement for Jesus to make. Nonetheless, he says it. It's recorded, so we have to address it. And I believe he's actually saying the same thing to us today. Now, of course, he's not talking literally. Eat my skin, <laughs> drink my blood. That would be weird. That's not what he's saying. He's speaking in metaphor. He's saying that the only thing that will fulfill, satisfy, and save the human soul is to receive me all of me. He's alluding to his sacrifice on the cross where his body would be broken and his blood would be shed for our healing and for the cleansing of our sins. That's why we partook in communion this morning. That's why we eat of the bread and we drink of the juice. That's what Jesus is talking about. And if we will accept this, if we will take him in, if we will put all of our faith and trust in what he has done for us through his death on the cross and through his resurrection on the third day, if we will continually feed upon him and depend upon him, then his eternal resurrection life becomes our life and our souls become satisfied unto eternal life. But again, this leaves us with a choice. Will we accept this or will we reject this? And unfortunately, the Bible says that many in the crowd that day, they heard the words of Jesus. They had been following him, but they heard this and they turned back and they followed him no more. Now that you've heard him say the same thing to you, what will be recorded of you in your life? Will you continue to follow or will you turn and follow him no more? And I end with this verse, verse 68. Jesus, he, he turns to his disciples. He goes, y'all going to walk away from me too? And I love Simon Peter's response. He speaks up on behalf of the group. This is what he says in verse 68. Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And also we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And my prayer is this, that those same words would be echoed in our hearts today. Come on, would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit teaches us from your word and the things that we've looked at this morning Holy Spirit we pray that you would seal them over our lives some of us Lord we needed encouragement we find ourselves father in the midst of a storm we thank you that you see us that you pray for us that you come to us through your Holy Spirit that you're able in a moment to do the miraculous but God if you don't we still trust you we look to you so we thank you for the encouragement that comes from your word. Holy Spirit, some of us need to be convicted this morning where we've been like the crowd and we've looked to you, Jesus. We've, we've followed you because of what you can do for us. In this moment, we, we take a step back and we get on our knees and we say, Lord, forgive us. We follow you because of who you are, because you're good because you're loving, because you're creator, because you're God. And then Father, even as we 
Look at this declaration of Jesus that he's the bread of life. He's the one that sustains. Help us now to make that choice to follow him, to put our faith in him, to not look to the left or to the right, to, to, to not look outside of what he offers, but truly to rest in the fact that he is the one that nourishes and sustains our soul. Help us to put this word into practice, Holy Spirit. Because our desire is that we would look like Jesus. Our desire is that the world would see us, and see a picture of the loving Savior. And then Holy Spirit, for those that are under the sound of my voice this morning that don't have a relationship with you, that have never put their trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross and his resurrection, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do what I cannot do, that you would convict hearts of sin. As I've said many times, that's not something I'm able to do, nor is it something that I want to do. But Holy Spirit, you can, and you do it so gently. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Holy Spirit, would you kindly convict hearts of sin right now? Would you reveal to them the chasm that exists between them in God. Would you reveal to them that no amount of good works or being a good person can fill that gap, but that truly Jesus is the only answer. So Holy Spirit, convict hearts of sin, but also, oh, convince them. Convince them of the, the love of Jesus. Convince them that he is the all-sufficient Savior. Open their eyes. Reveal to their eyes Jesus. I can't do that, Holy Spirit, but would you do it now? And Father, for those that are seeing Jesus and their need for him, I pray you would give them courage, give them articulation to cry out for help, to cry out for saving, to cry out for forgiveness of sin. And as they do, Holy Spirit, I thank you that in a moment you apply salvation to their life. You impute the righteousness of Jesus to their life. You take them from the kingdom of darkness and transpose them into the kingdom of light. You take them out of death and move them into life. You pour out God's love in their heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing that for those that cry out for salvation now. We love you, God. We need you. We're desperate for you. As a church, we're desperate for you. As a nation, we are desperate for you. Would you move in our midst? And God, as we get ready to dismiss today, I pray that you would bless your people. Would you keep them? Would you cause your face to shine on them? God, I ask that you would be gracious to them, that you would lift your countenance upon them, that you would give them your peace, and that as they go, they would know the love of the Father, that they would know the grace of our Lord Jesus, and that they would experience the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Again, we declare... We love you, Jesus, our bread of life. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.